11, and I'm reading to you from the Common English Bible. So let us listen to the words of John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, they don't have any wine. Jesus replied, woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. His mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby were six stone water jars used for the Jewish cleansing ritual, each able to hold about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some from them and take it to the head waiter. And they did. The head waiter tasted the water that had become wine. He didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the groom and said, Everyone serves the good wine first. They bring out the second-rate wine only when the guests are drinking freely. You kept the good wine until now. This was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, the title I gave this sermon today is, Can You Picture Jesus at a Party? Uh, some people have this view of Jesus that he was really, you know, straight-laced, serious, you know, everything was very uh, strict and formal all the time. But if you actually read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that was not Jesus of Nazareth. And so it is very much in character that Jesus would attend a wedding feast like this. Um, this story in John is an interesting story. Uh, you've heard me say before that the, the Gospels are unique literature. That's true of all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But John is, is even more unique, I think, than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, what all the Gospel writers do, but uh, John even more than the others, is John will tell a story, like the story we just read, and the surface story's pretty obvious. It's, uh, it's not difficult to get the the surface story, but John will give little clues to tell us that he's really also teaching a deeper spiritual meaning. And so what I want to do today is look at the story, because the story is an interesting story, and then we're going to try to see if we can discern the deeper spiritual meaning that John is trying to share with us. So the story, uh, here's a wedding. Weddings were big deals back then. Well, they are today, too, aren't they? Uh, but wedding parties would go on for several days in the ancient world. Life was tough in the uh, Judean countryside. There, the people didn't have a whole lot. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of fun. But the weddings were the time when people could kind of let down and just have fun. So a wedding feast was a big deal. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about this couple. We don't know their names. Don't have any idea what the young man did for a trade, how he made his living. Uh, the only thing that we know is that they live in the town of Cana, which was a very small village. So chances are the whole village came out for this wedding. And we know that uh, some way or another they knew Jesus because Jesus was invited, his mother was invited, and some of his disciples were invited, okay? And so they're out there having this big party. But then something terrible happens. They run out of wine. 
And in the ancient world, uh, this would have been humiliating and embarrassing to the host. It would be as if uh, they didn't know how to prepare. Uh, they didn't plan well. So this is a big deal, okay? This is a real big deal to these families who are responsible for putting this on. Well, in verse 3, Jesus' mother says to Jesus, they don't have any wine. Now, everybody here knows that when your mom says something like that to you, that means do something, right? <laughs> uh, when, uh, my, when I was a teenager, my mom... Uh, I loved her to death, but she, she had this bad habit of volunteering me for stuff uh, without me knowing anything about it. So, you know, if, if Mrs. Smith needed her lawn mowed, my mom said, hey, don't worry about that. Mike will do that for you. And then, then when I would get home as a typical uh, rebellious teenager, my mom would say to me, uh, you need to go mow Mrs. Jones' or Mrs. Smith's lawn, uh, because I told her you'd do it. I said, Mom, what? You know, I don't, you know, I don't want to be doing this. Well, what strikes me as is, is, uh, interesting is Jesus' reaction to his mother uh, sh shows that he's a little provoked. Uh, because in vo verse 4, uh, Jesus replied, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. Now that's, a, that's, that's, I said, you know, John likes to tell stuff on a couple different levels. Here's the first clue. My time hasn't come yet. Uh, you see in the Gospels, oftentimes the Gospel writers will say about Jesus, his time hasn't come yet. His time hasn't come yet. And then you get toward the end of the story and it says his time has come. And you know what that is? That's going to Jerusalem and dying on the cross. So Jesus had in his mind an idea of how his ministry was going to unfold. So he had kind of a, a, a plan, and he thinks that mom is kind of getting out in front and uh, getting ahead of the plan. So he says, my time has not come yet. But then I think it's funny in the next verse uh, verse 5, his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. See, see Mary knows that Jesus isn't going to let her down. He's, he's, he's going to take care of it. He may be a little provoked, but whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Well, then in the next verse, verse 6, John tells us that there were six stone water jars used for the uh, rite of cle uh, cleansing ritual. And these were big uh, jugs of water. It says they contained about 20 or 30 gallons. Now, if you were here last week, I talked about how in, in uh, ancient Judaism, they practiced a lot of ritual washings, and I tied that in with, with John the Baptist and baptism. Uh, so a ritual cleansing with water was very common. Now these six water jars, this isn't for baptism or anything like that. What these were for uh, was for, for the feasting. And uh, the, the, the Jewish community had these ritualistic uh, cleansing ceremonies for their hands. They weren't washing their hands for hygienic purposes, not to get the flu, because uh, they didn't, uh, didn't understand anything about that. Uh, but they were doing, these were ritual uh, cleansings. So the fact that you have this many water jars of that capacity uh, says this must have been a pretty good sized wedding. Well, Jesus then tells the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them to the brim. So these jars are full. And we've already been told that they will hold 20 or 30 gallons. So if they're full, you have six jars with 30 gallons of water. Think about that. That's 180 gallons. 
And what happens? The water turns into wine. Jesus changes the water into wine. Now listen, folks. You got a wedding party with 180 gallons of wine? That's a bunch of wine. That's a bunch of wine. Now, I want, you to, I want you to hold on to that thought because there's, I think there's a deeper lesson to this. Um, what the point I want you to get is the abundance, okay? Uh, keep, remember that word, abundant. The abundance of this wine, 180 gallons. And so then they take the wine to the head waiter. And the head waiter drinks it and says, wow, this stuff's good. And he said uh, to, the, to the groom, he says, this is unusual because usually you serve the good wine first, then after people have been drinking for a while, you kind of bring out the second-rate stuff. But you've saved the best to last. And see, he didn't have any idea of what Jesus, that Jesus had done this. And so then the story ends in verse 11 with uh, John saying, this was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory. Listen to that. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Okay, there's the story. There's the story. Now, I want us to see what John is saying in a spiritual way. Now, why do I think that there is a spiritual meaning to this? I think this because of what John himself says. Later in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John writes these words. Listen to what he said. He said, There were many other miracles that Jesus performed, that were not recorded in this book. But these were written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you would have life in his name. So John tells us why he wrote the miracle stories that he wrote in the gospel. He has an agenda. The purpose of the miracle stories is to bring about faith for us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we have life in his name. That's, so John has an agenda in telling the story. Now, in this story, there are two, two points that I want us to get for the deeper spiritual meaning of this. First of all, I want us to look at this thing about John saying that Jesus changed water to wine. Okay? Now, back in the ancient world, the Jewish rabbis often studied the scriptures and studied the prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And they would sit around and talk about this and write about this and kind of daydream about this. Uh, you know, sometimes I think we do that today, like about heaven. You know, we'll sit around and we'll talk about, gee, I wonder what heaven is like, and uh, kind of imagine, write about it, think about it, and so forth. Well, that's how they did the messianic kingdom. Uh, like I said earlier, times were tough, and they were looking forward to the time when the Messiah would come and they would kind of dream about, man, what's that going to be like? Well, here's one of the things that the rabbis wrote who lived during this time. I want you to listen to this quote. This is an interesting quote from Jewish rabbis. They wrote this. This age, present age, that they were living in, this age is like water. But the age to come will be like abundant wine. This age is like water.
But when the Messiah comes, it's going to be like abundant wine. So what does John do? He tells us a story about water becoming wine. And not just a little bit of wine, a bunch of wine. So what he is implying in this, here's the Messiah. And so he ends the story by saying his glory is revealed. So, so there is a, a spiritual meaning to the connection between water and wine. But the second thing I want us to notice in this story is I told you to hold on to that word abundance. In John chapter 10, verse 10, same gospel, same writer, but a little bit later, John says this. He quotes Jesus. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Now, I believe, and one of the reasons why I'm a pastor, is I believe that the Christian life is the greatest life that you can live here and hereafter. Can I have an amen on that? I, I truly believe that. Jesus came to bring us abundant life. And so what do we have in this story? Abundance. I mean, there's, there's, there's more wine than they would ever drink. 180 gallons. Abundance. Jesus comes to bring abundant life. In uh, the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, all of us know the story of the prodigal son, uh, the young boy that took off and left home and messed up his life, spent all of his money, and, you know, you know, his life was a total waste. He comes back home, and his father embraces him. Well, the father in that story is God, right? The prodigal son is you and me. All of us are the prodigal son at some point in our lives. And what, what does the father do? What does God do? He receives him back with grace and compassion. And in the story, what does he say? Let's have a party. We're going to kill the fatted calf. And we're going to party. What is salvation? Salvation's a big party. The abundant life. And that means that we have the abundant life even when the outward circumstances of life are not good. Let me give you an example. The Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And then you go down a few verses later, verse 13 of Philippians chapter 4. I'll get it out there in a minute. And he says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice in the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now those are very affirmative statements. And I want, to, I want a little question and answer thing here. I want to see if somebody can help me out. Where was Paul when he wrote Philippians? Anybody? Exactly right. He was in prison. He was in prison when he wrote those words. The outward circumstances of his life were in peril. And yet he says, rejoice in the Lord. I say again, rejoice in the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the abundant life that Jesus offers is not dependent upon outward circumstances. It's dependent upon the relationship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ on the inside. Can I have another amen? Amen. amen. But to enjoy the abundant life, 
You need to remember Mary's words back in our story. Mary said, remember when she said this? Do whatever he tells you to do. You're not going to find the abundant life just by coming in here and hearing about it. You will experience the abundant life when you do what he says to do. Amen? When you do what he says to do, that's when you experience the abundant life. And that's the spiritual meaning of John chapter 2. And all the God's people said, Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me?